Hi everyone. Welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Jennifer Gagnon with the Forest Landowner Education Program at Virginia Tech. And today I'm joining you from Claytor Lake State Park in Southwest Virginia. I have a special guest with me today, Judy McCord, and she's gonna be talking to us about vernal pools. My name's Judy McCord. <laughs> I'm a Virginia Master Naturalist with the New River Valley chapter of Master Naturalist. And one of the things that Master Naturalists do is citizen science projects. Um, there's all these different groups and maybe researchers out there that are looking for people to help out with learning about things in the environment. And one of the projects that we can do in our chapter is vernal pool monitoring. We have four pools here at Claytor Lake State Park that we monitor. Um, and we come out every two or three weeks during the vernal pool season and we measure the size of the pools. We look at what obligates, and I'll get to that later, we'll, we'll look at what obligates are in the pool, um, put the time on there, and let them know what's going on in these pools. The reason the vernal pools are important is because, well, one of the things is amphibians are, a lot of our <laughs> obligates are amphibians. And amphibians are kind of the canary in the coal mine, if you will. Amphibians have permeable skin, moist permeable skin. So if there's pollution or something like that in the air or in the water, that can kill the amphibians. So we want to keep the um, amphibian populations healthy. What is a vernal pool? A vernal pool is a pool in a forest that is filled by water, usually from snow melt and or runoff rain in the spring but the vernal pool is not connected to any other body of water it may be in a floodplain pools of water that are left when a river or a stream goes down after it's flooded it may be a rut in a forest service road it may be an intermittent stream that runs only in the spring or the winter when the water's high and then when it drops down, it leaves disconnected pools of water out through the woods. But it's not connected to any other body of water. And the reason that's important is because one of the big predators in any body of water is fish. And the vernal pools mostly dry up by summer. So fish cannot survive in the vernal pools. So we have less predation. We have fewer predators in a vernal pool and because of that there are animals that live only that breed only in the vernal pools they are called vernal pool obligates most of them are amphibians in virginia we have the maybe salamander and the tiger salamander both of which are endangered we have the mole salamander we have the marbled salamander we have the uh, Jefferson salamander, and we have kind of the poster child for vernal pools, the ones that you see large numbers of them going across the road and people will actually go out and try to stop cars to keep them from running over the spotted salamanders. So we have all those here in the state of Virginia. They're all in different areas. We don't have all those here in the park, but we have some of them. There's also the wood frog, which is a vernal pool obligate. And there are some tiny, tiny little crustaceans called fairy shrimp that only breed in the vernal pools. Now these animals don't live in the vernal pools all the time. They only breed in the vernal pools. They live in the forest surrounding the vernal pools. They may live in a one meter square plot of land their entire lives. They, only, they migrate to the pools to breed in the early, early spring, and then they go back to their little plot of land. So, when we're thinking about trying to protect our vernal pools, we need to protect not only the pool itself, but about 400 feet all the way around the vernal pool. Some of the things that we can do to protect that area is these salamanders are what we call fossorial. They live underground. They live in little burrows, maybe up underneath a dead woodfall. And you can see there's woodfall all around behind me, some a little more than there had been. Uh, but they live up under that woodfall. So if you can leave dead trees where they are, 
the salamanders can live under there. Leave the leaf litter down. Don't rake and mow and that kind of thing in the area around the vernal pools because these animals have to have their skin moist. They breathe through their skin. Their skin is moist. And so it's kind of a microclimate underneath those leaves. So we need to leave the leaves down, leave the logs down, and also try to keep a cover of trees, a good canopy over the, of trees over it to cool the area where they are. You put it out in the broad sunlight and they're gonna dry up a whole lot faster. So that's some of the things that we could do to protect the, the vernal pools, uh, is protect the area surrounding them as well as the pool itself. The first salamander to come to the vernal pools is the marbled salamander. The marbled salamanders do everything kind of backwards. Most of the salamanders that use the pools come in the spring and they lay their eggs in the pools and then they go back to the, to the forest. The marbled salamander females come to the pools in late fall and they lay their eggs under logs that are going to be covered up by the water in the spring. They will stay with those eggs all winter long, protecting them. And then when the, when the pool gets filled in the spring, they will, the young will hatch and the, the mother marbles will go back to the, um, to the forest where they, where they live. So the baby marbled salamanders are the first ones to hatch in the pools. Now the marbled salamander is the smallest of our vernal pool salamanders. He only gets to about four inches. But because they are the first ones laying eggs in the pool, they're the first ones hatched. And so they can um, utilize the other salamanders when they're laying their eggs. They can eat the egg masses of the other salamanders. Um, they're bigger than all the other salamanders, so when those babies hatch, they can eat those. And they eat other stuff, too. They eat, you know, insect larvae and whatever they can find. But if that pool freezes over and gets too frozen, then there's a chance that they might not survive the winter. Because they'll hatch November, October, November, usually. This pool, they did not hatch until early spring this year, so they don't have quite the, the uh, advantage this year that they normally would have be having hatched out in the fall. But hopefully they'll have enough to eat here and they'll be able to eat. So we've caught a baby marbled salamander here. Um, you're not supposed to catch them. You have to have a scientific collections permit to catch them. But we have caught one so that you can look at it and I'm covered under the permit here, so we can catch them for educational purposes and get a look at them. A baby salamander looks kind of like a tadpole, but I don't know if you can see it or not, they have feathery gills behind the head. Tadpoles do not have, they're basically head and tail, but the baby salamanders have feathery gills behind the head that they use. Once they become adult salamanders, they'll lose those gills and they will be adults, lungless, and also salamanders breathe through their skin. So they will become uh, adults and crawl out of the water. This pool we call the dump pool, uh, and it is not in the forest. My guess is this used to be a forested area, but when it was cleared for, it was logged and, and cleared um, and the pool is just kind of here now that's out in a field. So a lot of times the animals that lay their eggs in here, this pool has Jefferson salamanders in it. And also the fairy shrimp, which are the little crustaceans that live in vernal pools or breed in vernal pools. And we'll get a little bit more on those later. Um, but this pool now is actually out in the open and it dries up very, very quickly this year or every year. Um, the fairy shrimp are little tiny crustaceans. Think sea monkeys if you had those when you were a kid. The fairy shrimp only live for two or three weeks. They breed in the pool. They lay their eggs. Their eggs can drop down into the muck of the pool and they stay there until the pool has water in it again in certain conditions, I guess. But um, 
we've only found them in the pool one time in the six years, seven years we've been monitoring this pool. But they're carried from pool to pool on like say ducks that might fly from pool to pool and they can get the, the eggs or the fairy shrimp on them and carry them from pool to pool. The salamanders on the other hand return to their natal pool. They return to the pool where they were hatched. So they're not carried from pool to pool, but the fairy shrimp are a little bit different and they're tiny, tiny. I don't see any in the pool right now. Um, our shrimp we think are summer shrimp and so they'll come a little bit later in the season. So this, this pool is also utilized by other wildlife. My guess is there's been deer tramping around in here. We've caught ducks. We've seen ducks in here. Um, a few minutes ago, we saw a red spotted newt, which is one of the major predators of our salamanders, the red spotted newt. And they're everywhere in all wetlands. Um, but this one will probably dry up before these salamanders can, can become adults. But we always, we, we're always hopeful that they'll survive. <laughs> That kind of little blob out there is one of the Jefferson salamander egg masses. Jefferson salamanders have, um, their egg masses are about the size of golf balls. They'll, they're covered in a jelly-like consistency material. So you can't, in, you can't see the individual eggs because they're, co they're covered in this jelly-like material. But they lay golf ball size uh, egg masses. Those egg masses, they're, the egg masses are actually clear, but this, egg, this one, this pool has a lot of sediment in it. It's been raining here. The deer go out in it. So what looks like a, a kind of a blob is actually an egg mass. And I don't know what the fertility of that egg mass is now that it's all covered in sediment, but um, that's the Jefferson salamander egg masses. Spotted salamander egg masses in comparison are larger. They're more of a football size and they uh, will lay their eggs again. The, you see kind of rows of salamander eggs with the Jeffersons. The spotted salamanders would be more in clumps. There's three different colors of spotted out salamander egg masses. There's clear, and the clear ones sometimes get an algae in there, but it's a symbiotic relationship. The nutrients that the baby salamanders put out are taken up by the algae and utilized and the algae creates oxygen or you know makes oxygen for those developing eggs so they they might be green and some of the spotted salamanders are also um, cloudy they're kind of opaque looking and there doesn't seem to be any difference in viability between the different colors of the egg masses but spotted salamanders egg masses are somewhat larger than jefferson salamander egg masses one of the things we look for in the very early spring is what we call spermatophores. The males will come to the pools early on and they'll lay down these little, they look like little grains of rice, little packets of rice. And they'll lay those down in hopes that when the female comes, she'll pick up those spermatophores and use them to fertilize her eggs. This pool we call the Bear Drive Pool because it is on Bear Drive. It is about 10 feet from Bear Drive. Um, show you kind of the diversity of the pool. This pool, it's small. I think it's really pretty. Um, we have wood frogs and Jefferson salamander egg masses in here, or have had them. I don't see any today, but they're here. Um, they utilize this pool. We also have documented spring peepers in this pool and gray tree frogs in this pool. So the vernal pools are not only for the obligates. There's other animals that use these pools. But this just shows you a little bit about how the diversity of what the pools might look like. This one, again, it's about 10 feet from a road. We are standing kind of on top of a small hill and why the water stays in this pool as long as it does, I do not know. But this is a vernal pool in Claytor Lake State Park. We call this one the entrance pool. This pool at its largest is probably an acre in size, maybe. I'm not, I'm not really good with sizes, but this is a big pool. When it's at full capacity, which it is not at all today, um, that water is chest deep on me out in the middle. So it makes it really, really, really hard to monitor this pool because we're supposed to be finding egg masses and all the egg masses are out in the middle. But this pool 
is big enough that it has painted sliders. It has a, we saw a snapping turtle in here. We have a green heron out here. We've seen great horn, uh, great blue heron out here. We just startled a couple of mallards. We've seen wood ducks. There's all kinds of animals. There's dragonflies and damselflies. We've seen cedar waxwings taking baths in the edges of this pool. This pool is just vibrantly alive. Um, there are leeches in the pool. It is completely full of red spotted newts and bullfrogs and just all kinds of animals use this pool. We've seen deer drinking from this pool. So the vernal pools are important as for other wildlife besides the obligates. But again, this is a pool that is for the most part surrounded by forest. There's a lot of downed trees around for obligate salamanders to live under. Um, and it's just, it's a beautiful pool. <laughs> so we're going to try to catch a couple things just to look at in here. Okay, what we have here, I believe, is a wood frog egg mass. The wood frogs are communal breeders. They come together in the pool in large groups. You'll hear they've got kind of a call that sounds like a quack. So if you hear quacking coming in, say, January and February, the wood frogs can freeze solid and survive. So they are the first of the obligates that comes to the pool in the spring after, of course, the marbles. But their egg masses are laid in great big rafts of masses. This one, for some reason, is not with the mass, and I'm unsure whether it's spotted or wood frog, but I think it's wood frog. But you can see the baby developing embryo, embryos in there. The black little spots are developing embryos in that egg mass. They're going to hatch, and they've got little, their little tadpoles or little golden flecked tadpoles. They have little gold spots on them. And they've got two to three months before that pool dries up, and they've got to be out of there. Again, those tadpoles will not have um, gills behind their head. Tadpoles are just a head and a tail, whereas the salamanders have the gilled, gills behind their heads. This is a close-up of your wood frog egg mass. The eggs are individual. You can tell them all apart. You can kind of tell them all apart. If it was a salamander egg mass, there'd be a gelatinous coating around it. So. This is a wood frog egg mass. These are Jefferson salamander egg masses. I calculate about three egg masses in here. Again, they're about golf ball size. They don't lay anywhere near as many eggs as the spotted salamanders. The white ones are probably eggs that are not going to hatch. They're not viable. They either had a fungus or they're not fertilized or something. I'm not sure which, but the little black ones, if the newts don't eat them all, these guys are going to hatch into little tiny salamanders and hopefully survive to become adults in, out of this pool. So those are Jefferson salamander eggs. Well, thank you for spending 15 minutes in the forest with us. And thank you, Judy, for spending your afternoon with me to teach us about vernal pools. Be sure to join us again for another edition of 15 Minutes in the Forest in two weeks at 1215. Have a great weekend.